Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Francis. I am one of the members of the programming committee for this year's SOA annual meeting. Um, and you are at the session for, hold on, let me make sure I get this title right, uh, Principles and Practice for Accessible Digitization. So thank you very much for choosing to attend this. If you would like, you can enable closed captioning for this session uh, with Zoom. Um, it's one of the um, bottom components on your screen, and so it either shows as just show captions, or if you don't see it, you can click on more and select it from there. Um, throughout the session, feel free to place any questions that you might have into the chat, and I will read them to the presenters at the end of their uh, presentations. Um, and with that, I um, should mention our, pre our presenters. So first we have Sydney, who is the Digital Collections Manager at the University of Cincinnati Libraries, a BIPOC advocate and a lifelong learner. She is responsible for creating, implementing, and maintaining digital collections for UC Special Collections Libraries. Uh, Sydney has spent her career working to increase representation of traditionally underrepresented groups in academic library digital collections and is passionate about increasing the accessibility of the collection she stewards. She currently serves as co-chair of the UC Libraries Respect, uh, which is the Racial Equity Support Programming to Educate the Community Team, and is a former member of the DLF Accessibility Working Group. Uh, in her free time, she enjoys knitting, rock climbing, gaming, and spoiling her pets. And we have James, who is the Digital Projects and Preservation Librarian at the University of Cincinnati Libraries, uh, where he works in multiple roles, or has worked in multiple roles, uh, from serials acquisitions to software development. He currently focuses on digital collections maintenance and development and support of multiple facets of inclusion and access. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over Perfect. to our presenters. Thank you. Um, so thank you guys all for bearing with us as I get our presentation set up. But yeah, welcome to Principles and Practice for Accessible Digitization. Um, James and I are so happy to be here um, and we're really excited to give this presentation. Um, so we're going to start here with a disclaimer that um, what we're talking about today really applies to, you know, book and paper digitization or art. It really is not 100% applicable to things like born digital collections. So um, we just wanted to get that out there. Um, so we just wanted to start with our main principle, and that is that diversity and inclusion in digitized and digital collections cannot exclude accessibility. So oftentimes when we think about uh, diversity and inclusion in digital collections, we think about expanding the representation in our collections and in our content. And as a woman of color, this is so, so important. I would love to see more of our community represented in our collections. Um, but we also have to think about the importance of the accessibility of the content. Um, higher education has a history of uh, marginalizing those with disabilities, whether that's from physically inaccessible campuses to, phys to inaccessible coursework. Uh, so by not creating accessible digitized collections, we kind of con continue contributing to the systemic exclusion. Um, and so creating more accessible digital collections models kind of a higher level of diversity and inclusion for our digital collections as a whole. So a while back, James and I were doing research and reading this really wonderful book called Ensuring Digital Accessibility Through Process and Policy, which I highly, highly recommend for anyone who is interested. And this one quote really stood out to us and it said, one at a time accommodations introduce a time delay for the individual with disabilities. And this time delay is a form of societal discrimination. People with without disabilities have access to technology and information, but people with disabilities are placed in a holding pattern. And so a holding pattern systemically ensures that those with disabilities are the last to know and the last to be able to access information. And so we thought critically about what we could reasonably do to make our digital collections accessible 
to the largest group of people possible upon release of the collection. And we totally understood that we have our own limitations as every institution does. And maybe we couldn't create something that was perfectly 100% accessible, but we wanted to do the best we can with the resources that we had available to us. Um, and so with that quick introduction, I'm gonna pass it over to James to discuss the principles and the why behind why this is important. Great, thank you so much, Sydney. Um, as we as we move into this section, uh, why does UC Libraries need accessible digitized collections? I want to do a little more background on our team. Um, Sydney and I have been working together since 2018. Uh, we at that point had hired a new metadata librarian, had this new team, uh, our digital collections team, which at that point was split across multiple departments. Um, our team has evolved a lot since then. Our metadata librarian left um, early during COVID for a, a, a better job. And um, Sydney and I eventually did end up in the same department, strangely enough, in our library's uh, technical services unit. Um, but we, we were able to spend a lot of uh, 2020 working remotely, digging into these questions. Uh, we were fortunate though, starting in late 2019 is when our uh, our curiosity about accessible digital collections began to develop. But we understood that it was an important responsibility to work to fulfill. But at that time, we did not really understand the scope of the work or the full impact of working to internalize this responsibility. Our journey to understanding uh, began through engagement with our university's accessibility support staff to understand their approach for meeting accessibility goals and leading to our first answer to our question, why does UC Libraries need accessible digitized collections? So, thank you. So the University of Cincinnati has a very well-developed accessibility support community. And although some some of the stakeholders within the libraries do engage in this community, for some reason, historically, our digital collections team was largely outside of that. Our first steps to engage with this community uh, helped us to understand the importance of repositioning our collections work and uh, marketing our collection work to uh, within our library, uh, within this broader framework of our university's accessibility policies. So we have a we have a broad it's called an electronic and information technology accessibility policy uh, or EIT policy for short. This was developed in the context of a, a lawsuit and a, an out of court settlement between the university and the U.S. Department of Education in 2014. This was to ensure the accessibility of all the websites at UC. Um, the policy and the, the lawsuit were uh, enabled and developed in the context of uh, some relevant federal law, including sections 504 and 508 of the Non-Discrimination non Rehabilitation Act of 1973, as well as the more recent American with Disabilities Act, which um, established and the policy establishes established accessibility standards and expectations regarding the design development, acquisition, and use of electronic and information technology resources. Uh, the policy asserts that, <clears throat> excuse me, the policy asserts that a person with a disability should be afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally effective and equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. Further, a person with a disability must be able to obtain the information as fully, equally, and independently as a person without a disability. Uh, the scope of the policy is that it applies to services for everyone, you know, faculty, staff, students, prospective students, guests, and visitors. So since this agreement with the Department of Education, uh, UC has worked to develop a, a broad network of support that I mentioned earlier to help ensure uh, 
for for supporting a broad network of support for ensuring accessible technology and library and archives engagement with providing accessible services and resources continues to grow unfortunately however our our goals for complying with the policy did not fully consider uh, our, our content itself our assessments on the accessibility of the repository were designed to evaluate infrastructure by testing empty sandbox repositories you know and as yeah i i used to work with a, a, I, before i moved into this role with digital collections i worked as a software developer as part of the team that did all this work so i've like i've been able to kind of see how the sausage is made in terms of how it uh approaches compliance uh as as their directive rather than focusing on um, more directly on services and users so and the stakeholders so the stakeholders charged with meeting the accessibility goals for our websites which include our digital repositories actively work to exclude the collections themselves from their analysis um i'm not describing any bad faith to this action and perhaps the the task of addressing these legacy collections was too daunting and they were more interested in the sort of the task that was under the scope of what they were able to accomplish but nonetheless um the collections themselves were, were never part of this analysis never part of the work to guarantee uh accessibility so in any case for us, there was a clear opportunity to develop our work to help meet this mandate. Uh, although we have admittedly not yet considered fully how to address the looming problem of accessibility remediation for our legacy collection backlog, um, we understand the importance of good faith efforts. If, for example, there is ever a sudden need for accountability, for these in inaccessible collections, let's say there is a, another lawsuit or a university <laughs> office suddenly takes interest in why we have so much inaccessible content, um, our efforts to ensure accessibility of our new collections are going to be an important part of conversations about demonstrating our institution's readiness to develop systematic solutions. A slide. And this brings us to our our next answer, our second answer to why UC Libraries needs accessible digitized collections. This it this answer developed out of a practical need to justify our new approach to work. How do we approach this daunting, time-consuming, potentially very expensive task? Legal activism from disability rights advocates has advanced our understanding of our responsibilities under the law. The laws I mentioned before, the ADA and sections 504 and 508 of the Non-Discrimination non Rehabilitation Act. Many cultural heritage organizations operate under the scope of these laws, either because they receive federal funding or because they are places of public accommodation. And it's worth noting, too, that places of public accommodation can also extend to websites. For example, if the physical space and the website have a strong connection. A fun example of this in relatively recent case law was a lawsuit against Domino's Pizza for having an inaccessible website. Uh, so there's, you know, there's been a pattern, I think a laudable pattern, of disability rights advocates uh, identifying in, you know, working we're advocating for themselves through proactive lawsuits against companies that aren't meeting uh their obligations under i think in this case it would be the ada domino's is domino's pizza is a place of public accommodation uh and in, in that case i believe they found that although somebody with a disability could call the website um i'm sorry could call domino's to place an order uh, you, the experience is different. You're being able to do something independently, having access to different deals, for example, you know, good, good coupons that you get on the website. Uh, I, I ordered Domino's last night, so I'm familiar with this. Um, uh, you know, they have a different experience uh, online, and everybody is entitled to that. Uh, more relevant to higher education, Case law in this area is limited because unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, many lawsuits are settled following the example of our own institution. 
uh, then this means that uh, there is the, the outcomes and the agreements of the case are not part of the public record in the same sense that a legal decision is. Um, despite this, the broader conversation about accessibility universities is coming home to libraries. And I, I assume, you know, I know uh, we're speaking to largely an archives audience, and um, many of you may not be situated as we are within a larger library, but I think this applies to anyone who would be subject to the jurisdiction of um, Sections 504, 508, or the ADA. So there was a legal decision a few years ago, Payan or Payan versus Los Angeles Community College District, which provides more context. In this specific decision, a United States District Court found, among other things, that library databases constitute a service offered to students, and that the college discriminated against students by making available library websites that were inaccessible for blind students through JAWS, uh, JAWS being a popular free uh, screen reader. Now, while this case focused on purchased or licensed uh, electronic resources, uh, the decision makes it clear that in, it's incumbent on our community to provide reasonable modification to our policies, practices, and procedures. And then those terms, the, those terms I just use are really important. Those are the terms that get used in, in this decision and other related work about reasonable modification um, uh, and policies, practices, and procedures. There's a, the reasonable is a, is a complicated term, which is often assessed le legally in terms of the size and capacity of an organization. So in our case, working at an ARL library at the second largest university of Ohio, a lack of resources would not be a legally compelling constraint to justify any level of inaction. Now, no matter how how under resourced the library may be, you know the university as a whole is able to direct its resources to solve these problems and has an obligation, or to fulfill these obligations and has an obligation to do so. Slide. Thank you. Our third answer to why does UC libraries need accessible digitized collections grew out of identifying practice among other types of GLAM institutions. GLAM is a gallery, library, archive, and museum, uh, and working to reconceptualize what we're doing. My own work at UC has roots in traditional collect collection development, essentially the purchasing and stewarding of static resources. This mindset initially followed me into my work with digital collections, but has been challenged by two different areas in the GLAM industry that both have been setting and achieving accessibility goals for longer than we have, museums and publishing. Publishing, of course, is not traditionally under the GLAM umbrella, but academic libraries in particular have been increasingly shepherding publishing activities and initiatives, especially in the form of university presses or with the stewardship and sponsorship of the production of open educational resources or OERs. Publishing involves a lot of deep work with concerns like copyright and for born digital publishing, especially accessibility is absolutely core to production workflows. Museum studies um, has been grappling with making art accessible especially through the development of image description for a very long time. Uh, I, I found a great website for an organization uh, called Art Beyond Sight that recently celebrated its 30th anniversary. This organization um, works to make art accessible uh, through multiple modalities for individuals with, with disabilities. Uh, both of these areas, publishing and museum studies, uh, embody an ethic of editing or of curation teaching us uh, that smaller is often better. These areas have challenged us to reconceptualize our work and our journey towards accessible digital collections has been accompanied by a shift in mindset towards paced, thoughtful work where accessibility planning is part of the first steps of our project workflow and where a curatorial approach helps us to tackle, helps us to tackle challenging collections in stages. This mindset was helpful for us as we um, 
it was a helpful frame for us as we shift from a production or numbers orientation and work to internalize the cost of integrating accessibility as part of digital collection development. Finally, we have also identified several obligations that compelled us to understand and improve uh, the practice of our uh, responsibilities. These moral, ethical, and sustainability obligations are the final answer to our question of why. First, to build on Sydney's earlier point about the connection between accessibility and diversity and inclusion, disability is culturally defined, and our decisions help either to perpetuate or to reduce cultural exclusion. By publishing digital collections without satisfying accessibility requirements, um, guaranteeing that those with disabilities are the last to know, we're acting as agents of cultural exclusion. This alone is reason enough to ensure that we're working towards publishing accessible collections. Further, we have been struck by the discord between the standards that are applied in our community. Many digitization professionals seek to adhere to the FAGI guidelines or the Federal Agency Digital Guidelines Initiative, um, technical guidelines for image reformatting. These require high quality imaging and professional handling of materials. In fact, in fact, during a period of investment in the mid 2010s, our own institution spent nearly $100,000 on equipment, software and training to ensure we could comply with the most rigorous levels of the FAGI guidelines. In stark contrast, on the other hand, at the same time, um, we were investing in meeting these imaging guidelines. Our practice for document accessibility was to publish uncorrected OCR and to provide page images in a repository with minimal or non-existent text access. And you know, in many cases, this OCR was run on documents uh, generated complete garbage, uh, like the, no real English was recognized and was put into a repository like that anyway, which really actually makes the whole our whole repository and search experience even worse. A brief survey across peer repositories suggests that this dichotomy is common. Uh, our position is that it is, isn't reasonable to invest so deeply in one set of guidelines or mostly ignoring guidelines for accessibility. We considered sustainability of access. To, we also considered sustainability of access to our collections. We're certain that our digital collections will increasingly be subject to the application of accessibility standards uh, from external forces, and we're concerned about ensuring that our collections can remain available. Uh, for example, if we uh, were to run into a mandate that said, if these aren't accessible by the end of the year, we can't have them online. That's the sort of situation we really uh, want to avoid. So for us, this means doing the work now to understand how to stop creating inaccessible collections. Our goal here is to halt the growth of technical debt in the form of unremediated or inaccessible collections and allow us to use our developing expertise as the basis for planning to address that large backlog of inaccessible collections. Further, related to sustainability, we're concerned about scarcity. At our own institution, infrastructure is scarce. Uh, ironically, we're part of the Sambara repository community, and we have a local software development team focused on library needs. Uh, but historically, they've been unable to uh, support well, Within their scope, they're unable to support the accessibility needs of the content itself and historically have been you know, unable to uh, plan and execute sustainable projects. Uh, the UC Library has attempted to develop a general purpose digital repository to support our content, but this effort ultimately failed and we were forced to do an emergency migration to a hosted repository that doesn't meet our needs. And now our main repository does little to nothing to support the accessibility of our content itself. And highlighted by this previous point, web-based content delivery has not been wholly appropriate for presenting accessible digitized documents. For example, cutting edge tools like Triple IF, uh, which is the, so the modern image viewer that gives you the ability to move around and zoom into images. Um, so tools like this, which rely on the orchestration of multiple server and client-based technologies for the delivery and use of content, 
but they don't really appear to be designed to support the needs of accessible documents, for example. If they don't let you interact with the text in a way that makes it accessible. So to ensure sustainability in the context of scarce or insufficient infrastructure, for us, it's important that accessibility is inherent to our digital objects and decoupled from our repository interface. Now, this position supported our move to a standard for accessible PDF documents that meets the needs of people who use screen readers to access content and um, further meets users where they are instead of requiring that they meet us at our repositories and use our tools for accessing content. Sydney will share more about this and other standards and how we use them. Thanks so much, James. So I'm going to discuss here how we apply the principles that James just discussed um, to the practice and our workflows in digitization. And so to do this, we use three main tools or standards that I'm going to go through today. And the first of the three is PDF universal accessibility. And that is the PDF standard that James mentioned before. So we use PDF UA, PDF Universal Accessibility, um, a program called Transcribus to transcribe any handwritten manuscripts or letters. And uh, thirdly, we use image description and alt text to make sure that we make our images accessible. So we're gonna go through each of these tools and standards, and I'll explain a little bit about how we implement these in our workflows and why they're important for our us to use at our institution. So starting with PDF UA, um, as James mentioned before, we looked online to try to see what other institutions were doing in this area, and we found a lot of really cool implementations of accessible uh, digital collections or archives. Um, our favorite was the Helen Keller Archive, which has a variety of tools to make their collections accessible through their interface, their user interface. And we just really love this implement implementation. There were so many options uh, to create um, accessible collections for them, um, but we realized that we just really couldn't do the same thing. As James mentioned before, our scarce infrastructure meant that we didn't have a repository with the amazing features that the Helen Keller Archive did, and it was nearly impossible for us to model our accessibility work after um, their shining example. Um, so, Ultimately, we found very little that was publicly available that fit in our criteria of what we needed to make our collections and our content accessible. Um, so we needed something that made our content accessible without relying on our repository or a user interface. And that is where PDF UA uh, really came in handy for us. So PDF UA, as the slide says here, is an ISO standard for universal PDF accessibility. And uh, in one sentence, it just, it allows those with disabilities to say, make the same quality use of PDFs as those without disabilities. Um, and so with this standard, how do we create PDF UA? Uh, the PDF UA standard is one that has a whole bunch of different requirements. So our caveat here is that not 100% of what we put out conforms 100% to the PDF UA standards. Um, but like James said, we're making good faith efforts to do what we can with what we have. Um, and so with this in mind, we use Abby Fine Reader to OCR all of our content. And if it's for a more curated small collections, uh, we do edit and go through to make sure all the OCR is correct. We use Adobe Acrobat Pro DC uh, to actually edit our PDFs and set reading order or use our headers and things like that. Um, and lastly, we use Transcribus to transcribe any handwritten or manual, uh, manually written manuscript manuscripts uh, that we may be digitizing. And with these three tools, um, we've been able to create PDF UAs to ingest into our repository that allow for higher level of accessibility than what we were producing before. So 
although not everything, like I said, conforms 100%, um, we try our best. And I think the thing that gets us the most about PDFUA is that we struggle with uh, maintaining FAGI standards for our images, but on older things, they may have, you know, faded ink or it's hard to read what's on the image. And for that reason, uh, maybe we don't edit the image and the contrast is not as great. Um, so we don't conform to PDFUA standards in that way. So there are some things that you've got to balance when it comes to cultural heritage items, the PAGI standards and uh, conforming to accessibility standards. So that is uh, how we use and how we create PDF UAs for our collections. And next we're gonna talk about Transcribus, which is a simple program that lets you and your team collaborate on transcriptions. And so Transcribus works in a few different ways. And one of those ways is to use predetermined language sets to automatically OCR handwritten work. Uh, this is a paid feature, so we don't use this quite as often, but we have used it before. We actually used a like, 14th century Dutch language set to try to OCR handwritten English manuscript and it worked. So it's really cool the different implementations you can use with the different sets of languages that they have available. Um, however, we mostly use the manual transcription feature in Transcribus, which is free, and it is so wonderful because it allows for team flexibility. So if I own a collection in Transcribus with 50 items and I have five student staff who are helping me transcribe, I can assign 10 items to each student staff member to their account and I can view what they're transcribing and maybe help them edit things when they're done and do QC when they're done. Um, it is a really good tool for co collaboration. And so here we're gonna look at what Transcribus kind of looks like when you're using it. And on the left here, you see the document being transcribed, and on the right, it is the transcription. And what I really love about Transcribus is that on the left, uh, in the document, you can see lines that are numbered, and they go through and the entire document and set lines for you to transcribe. And the great thing about this is that you can edit the length of the lines and where they're positioned on the paper. And so that your output, your PDF uh, has OCR in the exact correct place that it needs to be on the page. Uh, we love using Transcribus and it has been an invaluable tool for us in terms of making handwritten items uh, a little bit more accessible. So with that, we're going to move to talking about image descriptions and alt text. And uh, these two standards just make your PDF or make your images uh, more accessible by screen reader by providing a description of the image that can be read out to someone who may not be able to see uh, the content. And this is super helpful for those with sight impairments. It is really easy to implement because almost every program now has a section for alt text. So whether you're using Adobe Acrobat for your PDFs, if you're putting in alt text into your repository or uh, anything like that, like there's an alt text box that usually pops up with most modern programs. So it's pretty easy and you there's nothing you have to do specifically to get that to show up, which is really nice. Um, one downside, I think, especially to image description, is that it can be labor intensive. If we're writing a full paragraph for every image in a collection, uh, that labor adds up. So sometimes we have to balance, maybe for larger collections, we use alt text, and for more curated collections, we go with image description. It just kind of varies and depends from collection to collection. But overall, we have started implementing alt text or image description on almost every image that we publish in a digital collection. So here we're gonna look through a few examples of alt text and image description with my lovely cat Cosmo. Uh, and here you can see kind of the difference between alt text and image description. Alt text uh, kind of just describes 
generally what is in the image in like one or two very short truncated sentences. It really doesn't go into much detail. This is a photograph of a cat sitting on a blanket and that's all it is. Uh, it gives you an idea of what's there, but it doesn't really tell you uh, set the scene or set context or anything like that. Whereas for the image description, you can see that it goes into so much more detail and kind of just lets you imagine the image if you couldn't see it. So it says things like it's a fuzzy blanket. It's a gray and white cat. Um, he's got green eyes and he's got a blue fish shaped tag. All these things just kind of allow someone who may not be able to see the image uh, to imagine and visualize in their head what is going on so that they can put that in context to maybe something they're reading or whatever it is that they're doing research for. And so image descriptions and alt text are both pivotal and very, very important to the accessibility of our collections, especially since a lot of what we work on are images and very visual resources for digital collections. Uh, so with these three, our PDF UA, our transcribist, and using image descriptions and alt text, we've managed to create digital collections that are um, a little bit more accessible than before and really show our good faith efforts towards making collections that are more usable by people upon release so they don't have to come and ask us for accessible versions for a lot of the more common things. So to wrap up here, our principles are that diverse digital collections live at the intersection of representation and accessibility. So this means that accessibility is a first class consideration when we're thinking about inclusion as part of our digital collection strategy. Um, our practice workflows and standards allow us to work within our limitations to create more accessible content. We have redefined our workflows in an effort to accept and internalize the cost of accessibility work um, because we do recognize that it is more expensive to create an accessible collection in terms of labor and resources. So we've adopted standards to help us create accessible content which meets users at their point of need because of our scarce infrastructure. Um, so the outcome, the hope, and our goal is that digital collections will support all users' research and learning in an increasingly diverse and accessible way. So thank you guys all so much for listening to our presentation. We're so excited to share a little bit about our accessibility work with everyone here. And um, if you happen to get the slides, We've got a list of resources here. If you're really interested in any one of these topics, all of these are really wonderful reading. And we've got a link to our slides here as well. So again, thank you guys so much. And yeah, we had a great, we had a great time putting this presentation together and we hope that you learned a little bit. I'll put the link to the slides in the chat. Oh, okay, great. Thank you, James. Awesome. Yes. And thank you so much, Sydney and James. Um, that was a absolutely fantastic presentation. Greatly appreciated it. Um, and so, yeah, um, as a reminder for everyone that's attending, uh, if you have any questions or thoughts that you'd like to share with the presenters and the rest of the group, please use the uh, chat option that's available through Zoom. And I will uh, read anything submitted to the presenters. Um, and while we maybe wait for some questions to come in, um, one question that popped into my mind just because of the way my brain works, and now that I'm about it, it's not a great question because you might just say no, and then that'll be the end of it, but that's okay. We're, we're going to ask it anyways. Um, I really appreciated how you focused on the importance of policy and process um, over one-time solutions for accommodation. Um, and how that lets you move forward in a more strategic and meaningful way. Um, with that, though, I'm curious if you've um, ever had to do a use a one-time accommodation um, that helped you refine a process or policy that you had in place. Like you already had a policy or process, and then a situation arose that really didn't address what you were trying to achieve. 
um, and maybe just what that looked like and how you found a solution and then correspondingly updated uh, your pro processes moving forward to be more efficient. And like I said, the answer might be no, and that's okay. Yeah, I think so. The, one of the things about our team is that, uh, so the answer is, I think the answer is no. Sydney, interrupt me if you think I'm wrong. We haven't had a, we haven't had a lot of, um, we haven't had any like demands on our like oh make this accessible that has not come up yet um but one of the things about our team is that uh uc libraries i know this is being recorded i have tenure so i'll just go ahead and say it uh, uc libraries invested a lot in digital collections building in the middle uh 2010s um uh and everything fell apart in 2018 and uh, uh, this actually turned out to kind of work to our advantage we and we started from scratch in a way. Uh, you know, we had, like, every our team leaders left. You know, we had um, uh, additional talent. You know, so much of our digital collections talent has left. You know, I'm sure uh, most of you know who Eric Tansy is. She used to be our colleague. Uh, she's written a little bit about the dysfunction uh, that she worked under here. And uh, for for us you know we were able to kind of start from scratch without any of the baggage of uh, expectations that i think a well-established digital collections building program would have had there wasn't anyone asking us for substantial scale uh because everything had fallen apart and we were we were starting over again and around that same time that we began to start over um COVID hit which gave us uh, a lot of breathing room, I think, to be more thoughtful and to, uh, to come up with all of the principles and practices that we've laid out here today. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to say that anyway. The idea didn't really fit into the presentation. Uh, oh, my cat's here. He didn't. He's mad because he didn't make it into the slides. <laughs> Snickerdoodle. Um, I think I forgot to feed him because he usually doesn't visit me. Um, but yeah, so. You know, there there isn't a lot. There wasn't a lot of um, pre-existing context that we were trying to implement mm -hmm. these ideas in within. Yeah, we often think about the pandemic, working from home, um, and sadly losing a lot of our digital collections talent. It was really rough for us, but in the end, I feel like it gave us that creativity to recreate our policies uh, to something that, you know, fits our scale as a team of only two people and also moves us forward in the accessibility direction. Yeah. So I feel and that, like- um, That book, Sydney, would you pop over to the resources slides? Yes. This book, Ensuring Digital Accessibility Through Process and Policy, Sydney and I did kind of like a book club with this throughout 2020. Uh, this, this was, huge for us um, yeah i've run into this with digital preservation as well yeah with accessibility with digital preservation there's this sense that these are um technical problems um but really the the technical stuff is just a small fraction at most it's a third of what you're dealing with um but it's probably less than that and you know d accessibility is a uh is a cultural uh, phenomenon. And that's part of what UC is trying to achieve with training and support for, for example, all of our teaching faculty to make accessible content for their classes. Well, I mean, most classes are hybrid to some extent between in person and online. And you know, Sydney said at the outset that most of what we're saying doesn't apply to born digital collections. Um, I've personally grappled with if we get a if we get a trove of inaccessible born digital objects. Yeah, this kind of goes back to our dichotomy with do we confine, do we conform to FADGI standards or do we uh, conform to PDF UA? Um, with digital, with born digital objects, uh, how do you balance the obligation to kind of you know, preserve the original thing versus transforming it to make it accessible? Um, of course, the, the best answer is that you're working within a context and a culture that produces uh, accessible documents in the first place so that there isn't anything to do in that regard and those are those are cultural process and policy uh questions holding everyone in the organization that you're serving accountable to pr producing accessible output awesome thank you and then um going to a question from the chat 
Um, in terms of balancing visual organization of PDF materials with headers, page numbers, footnotes, et cetera, um, with fluency of screen reader, um, reading order, and embedded images, is there a standard or formula you rely on, or is the paragraph order and the or like and then the order in which the footnotes, embedded images, et cetera, are introduced more on just a case by case basis? So I could take this question, and uh, the answer to this is that there is no standard. Uh, it is a case by case basis, and it is based on your own logical thinking. So when you're going through and setting reading order for a really complicated page, such as a newspaper, a newspaper has, uh, you know, like three, three different columns and articles going on. There's ads, there's all these things going on. And so for our newspapers, what we decided that we would allow the person setting the reading order to logically decide, hey, if I were reading this newspaper, what does my eye go to first? And we start with all the important content, like the articles, and then we decided that even if an ad was at the top of the page, we're going to make all the ads uh, get read or by the screen reader at the end of the page because that way it doesn't interrupt the flow of the actual content quite as much. Um, and it really is a case by case basis uh, how you decide to organize. But uh, I would say generally uh, it is based on how do you feel like you would read this page if you were just like scanning through and reading it normally? And that's the order that I would set in if I were working on it. Um, that's the order that I would create. And it might differ a little bit from person to person. But overall, I feel like if there's a human person saying, logically, this makes sense, um, then when a screen reader reads it out, it should, you know, hopefully make sense. I'll, I'll add to, uh, I've worked a little bit um, to so we, our internal accessibility community within the libraries has included folks from our press unit where they're dealing with you know, born digital publishing journal articles, for example. And um, so if you're dealing with a document that has footnotes or endnotes, um, it, you can kind of temper your goals by just making sure that you are uh, recreating the experience of interacting with the, the thing that you have. You don't need to add more than is already there. So like uh, a journal article that you're holding in your hand does not have hyperlinks. There's no way to like use something within the document to jump to another page to read endnotes. Um, and PDF UA does not, it, it will create a table of contents from the headers that you put in there, but it does not need you to address structure that might span across pages. And it was the born digital, uh, the, our publishing people had had to do that sort of stuff that, you know, the hyperlinks and the footnotes and the end of, they all had to link to each other. And then you needed to be able to go back to where you were. Um, uh, so yeah, ideally we have the resources to do everything to create like the best experience that you can, but practically, um, your goal is to make sure the experience is this is in practice as similar as uh, possible. Um, so it, it doesn't doesn't need to be more complicated than what you can see. Mm -hmm. So I would say the potential for digital collections accessibility and usability is much higher than that of um, you know just manual looking through a newspaper or a collection physically because you could you know like. If in a perfect world, if we were digitizing a newspaper, we could say an article stops and says continues on page three, you could click that and it would jump to page three. Um, but if you're manually viewing this newspaper, you have to physically turn the pages. And so when we're uh, thinking about accessibility and how to make our, news our digital newspapers accessible, we just want, like James said, for it to be on par with how we would use it physically. The potential for digital collections is much higher, but um, that would require tons of resources and labor and time. And that's where we're making good faith efforts. Very cool. Um, and then one other question that I have, um, thinking about some of your responses to the previous questions and building off some of that, um, 
during the presentation and your answers, you know, you've talked a lot about making sure you're fitting like your local scale and reasonable resources, which is, you know, really important. Um, and recognizing that almost any librarian or archivist would say that their institution's probably underfunded. Um, I'm just wondering on the more like general mindset advice part for archivists or librarians who are maybe feeling overwhelmed about the idea of trying to create more accessible digital collections. Uh, what just general advice you would have for them yeah. on how to proactively move forward? Yeah, the, so the biggest thing for us was in, internalizing this mindset that a digital collection is not an analog of a physical collection. So when you're, this is the, that curation mindset where if you're, you, we, we've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, one of our mistakes was digitizing the, in its entirety uh, the contents of a what we thought was medium to small 16 box collection. Uh, it's a really cool collection. Some of it's online at the James and John B. Uh, McNamara papers from these uh, 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 mid early mid 20th century um, communists who firebombed the LA Times, one of those trial of the century deals. There's like letters between them and like the Communist Party of America and Clarence Darrow, their, their lawyer. But you know, we thought this was a small collection and we're still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Sydney imaged it in 2019. Um, if we were to start from scratch on that collection, uh, uh, we would say, you know, let's pick a hundred items that highlight this. And if that, if that, if the outcome of that is a successful project, then that will help justify the resources for doing more. So it, it's it sometimes feels kind of lame, like we're working as like a outreach and marketing uh, department in how we're approaching digital collections. Uh, but it's, it's really, I think the most sensible way to um, achieve sort of, sort of foundational sustainable uh, success. And this is part of why we went big on the, the legal and policy stuff is that's the bad guy that we point to. And if, like, if, if we're being asked to do more, we can say, no, here's what our obligation is. It's very well defined. Do you want to put it in writing that you want me to ignore this obligation? Um, uh, it's, uh, let's, let's focus on successful smaller scale collections instead. I think when we started working on digital collections, James and I as a team, we were feeling a little bit um, beaten about the fact that a lot of our team members left and it was the two of us trying to recreate a digital collections program but in the end it was a little bit of a blessing in disguise in terms of our accessibility work because that's the thing that made us step back and think well we are so limited in our resources now um we don't have tons of money or uh support so what can we do that is still feasible for two people and will create collections that, you know, in some ways stand out. And that for us, that was the accessibility piece because we couldn't do the volume that a lot of other institutions are digitizing at. Um, we just didn't have the capacity for that. Um, we started heading in a different direction um, and we chose accessibility over uh, the volume of, of materials we're putting out. I'll add that there one one challenge that we've had is uh, if we're asked for a, what's what's the cost of digitizing something, uh, we don't really we're still working on sort of understanding and modeling uh, how to how to count time spent on accessibility. Now, our student workers don't they don't operate our our scanner our imaging equipment. They do the accessibility work instead, and how that goes depends very, very deeply on sort of the aptitude of that student. Um, I, you know, Sydney can can knock out image descriptions and I am I will spend like two hours on one. Uh, you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm more the heart of this operation. She's more the actual ability. <laughs> um, but uh, the, or it, I think there's an area of research. You know, we have digitization and stewardship cost calculators. And there's kind of, there's like an area in there that say like, oh, what's the extra, what's extra labor that is going to be involved in this? And working as a profession on kind of understanding the real cost of the accessibility work, um, 
I think is a real opportunity to publish the papers and do some presentations. I think there's also like the prom the perpetual promise of uh, what AI can bring, um, and that's you know that's something we've learned to be skeptical of. But there are some you know, some solutions are better than others. You know, it, there's been a lot of attention to um, transcription of audio, and so it's easier to bring resources to bear to support captioning for videos, uh, which is an area we're beginning to explore. But um, at the end of the day, you re you need people doing the work who understand how to produce accessible documents. And so you know, kind of justifying to yourself, oh, in the future, AI will be able to do all of this uh, is maybe at least half dishonest because you need somebody knowing that the AI is acting appropriately and uh, outputting what you need. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And um, that brings us just about to the end time for our session. Um, I do just want to mention that you did get lots of thank yous um, for both the presentations and the resources within the chat. So um, it's definitely extremely appreciated. And I hope you have a wonderful day. And for all the attendees, if you would like to fill out a session evaluation form for the programming committee to look at, um, as we plan future meetings, uh, there is a link available through the program um, for that. So again, thank you so much, James and Sydney. Uh, Absolutely. And if anyone has any questions, we love talking about this stuff. We as you really can probably do. Tell. So we would be happy to answer emails, schedule calls, whatever. Thank you. Awesome. And our next concurrent sessions are at 11 o'clock with links again in the program. Um, I assume everyone knows how to find them by this point if you're here. Um, and so, yeah, enjoy the rest of SOA, everyone. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.